Hey family, I'm PT, Pastor Ture Roberts, and the lead pastor of the Potter's House at 1 LA in Denver. And on behalf of my wife, Pastor Sarah and myself, we want to welcome you to our channel and to this word. I cannot wait for you to hear what God has for you in this message. I want to tell you a few things really quickly. Subscribe. If you're not already subscribed to this channel, subscribe so that you can be made aware of all of the word that's coming at you week in and week out, and also turn on your notifications so you don't miss a morsel that comes forth. We're also grateful for you and your partnership. If you are so uh, it compelled, we invite you to support what we're doing, not just our church, but what our church is doing. There are a number of outreaches, a number of things, critical, necessary things that we support, and we're able to do it because of your generosity. So without further ado, let's get right into this word. God bless you. I'll see you soon. Listen, I want to get right into the word because I believe that God has a word that is specifically designed with you in mind. I'm going to be speaking from 1 Samuel 9. I'm going to start in verse 16. It is our custom to stand for the reading of the word. So if you are able, we'd ask that you just acknowledge our custom. And verse 16 begins, it says... Now this is the Lord talking to the prophet Samuel. And he says, tomorrow about this time, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin and you shall anoint him commander over my people Israel, that he may save my people from the hand of the Philistines. For I have looked upon my people because their cry has come to me. So when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said to him, there he is, the man of whom I spoke to you. This one shall reign over my people. Now Saul has no idea what's going on. He's looking for his donkeys. He doesn't even know that he's about to be anointed king of Israel. So Saul draws near to Samuel and says to him, please tell me where is the seer's house? Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. Go up before me to the high place, for you shall eat with me today, and tomorrow I will let you go and will tell you all that is in your heart. But as for your donkeys that were lost three days ago, do not be anxious about them, for they have been found. And on whom is all the desire of Israel? Is it not on you and on all of your father's house? And Saul answered and said, Am I not a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel? And my family, the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin, why then do you speak like this to me? Why then would you tell me that I could be king when I'm the smallest of all of the tribes, when I don't have anything to work with like everyone else did? I'm just looking for my donkeys and now I'm going to be king. And Samuel took Saul and his servant and brought them into the hall and had them sit in the place of honor among those who were invited. There were about 30 persons. And Samuel said to the cook, bring the portion which I gave you of which I said to you, set it apart. So the cook took up the thigh with its upper part and set it before Saul. And Samuel said, here it is. What was kept back, it was set apart for you. Eat, for until this time it has been kept for you since I said, I invited the people. So Saul ate with Samuel that day. My subject for this morning is eat like a king. Father God, we just ask that you would sit in this place. God, you know the word that this world needs better than me, better than anyone standing. And so God, we ask that this would be a prophetic moment, that you would use this text, that you would use every resource that is available to me ultimately so that your word can shine through. And so God, I ask that you would remove any distractions and that this would be a one-on-one -on -one encounter with you because we recognize that in your presence, that's where the fullness of our joy is. In your presence, that's where vision is. In your presence, that's where creativity is. In your presence, we can't be depressed. In your presence, there is no mountain too high, no valley too low. And so God, we're asking that it would be your presence that spreads throughout this atmosphere. 
and that it would be your presence that we take with us. So God, I ask that there would be no nerves, no fear, no anxiety, no insecurity, just your word, your anointing, your power shining through me. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can get seated and be comfortable. There's this poet that I follow on Instagram. Her name is Naira Wahid. And she posted this poem that made me automatically follow her. And this poem, it goes like this. It says, she asked, you are in love. What does love look like? To which I replied, like everything I've ever lost, come back to me. I love that. I love that because I know that it's exactly how I felt when I met my husband, our pastor, Pastor Ture. Yes. When I met him, I felt like everything I ever lost came back to me in this one person. The other day, he posted about how we made a decision in our marriage to never lose the butterflies. And it was such a beautiful post when he posted it. We decided we would never let the honeymoon be over. And people were commenting about how romantic it was and how sweet it was. But I have to tell you, that moment was actually not that romantic. <laughs> yeah. If I could set the stage for you. It was four weeks after I had our daughter, Ella. I was tired. I was sore. I wasn't sleeping that much. I was struggling with my body. I was having all of these issues. But my husband, my husband was living his best life. <laughs> LAPT was fully rested. He was losing 10 pounds without even trying. He's like, I don't know what this is. I'm just losing weight. It's just all falling off of me. He's closing deals. He's traveling. And he came home, and I had an attitude but not like one of those attitudes that you can actually let people know that you have. I just did petty things like only turn down my side of the bed at nighttime, <laughs> made myself a plate for dinner and was like, yeah, you can go over there and make yours. <laughs> and um, he was like, what's up with you? What's going on? And I was like, I don't know. I just think the honeymoon is over. And he goes, I don't give you butterflies anymore. I was like, well, I mean, I felt a caterpillar when you asked me that question. <laughs> Not like a full butterfly, but I guess something could happen there. And that was the moment we decided that we would never lose the butterflies. Because we realized that though we were living in overflow with the birth of our daughter, that if we were not intentional, that we would end up losing what produced our daughter in the first place. And I just wonder how many of us lose things along the way that we just accept as being lost forever. I used to be confident. I used to have passion. I used to feel like I lived a life of purpose, but something happened, something shifted, and I just don't know what happened. Not only do I not know what happened, but I'm not even actively looking for what I lost. I've just learned to live with that piece of me gone. I'm a church girl. And there's this song they used to sing in church that says, I went into the enemy's camp and I took back what he stole from me. It's a great song because it is not that the enemy will not steal from you. It just means that the enemy can't keep what he stole. It doesn't mean that depression won't take something from you. It doesn't mean that life won't take something from you. It just means that life can't keep what it stole. It means that I'm not gonna learn to live with this thing just lost. I'm not just gonna live with this half version of who I am. If you take it from me, I'm coming back to get it because there is a blessing attached to every part of me. That means you're gonna have to give me my joy back. That means you're gonna have to give me my power back. That means you're gonna have to give me my anointing back. You can't just take Take it from me. I want it back. I want it back because when God gave it to me, there was a blessing connected to it. 
And if we are not careful, there will be things that we lose along the way that we just resign ourselves to never finding again. And so I want to challenge you to never forget the value of what you lost. Never forget the value and what you lost. Because the enemy's camp sometimes is disguised as a divorce. And the enemy's camp sometimes is designed as, I got released from a job. The enemy's camp is sometimes disguised as these life situations, and it would be so easy for us to say that I just don't need that part of me, but it takes a special kind of person to say, I'm going to go back into the enemy's camp. I'm going to go back into that season of my life that changed me and shaped me, and I'm going to find the joy connected to it. I'm going to find the wisdom connected to it, because my word told me that all things will work together for my good, and if that thing has not worked together for my good, that means there's still something down on the inside of that situation that is going to make me better. Don't, don't give up on what you lost. Don't give up on what you lost. You might have to fight for it. You may have to lose some friendships over it. You may have to change your environment for it. But I'm telling you right now, don't give up on what you lost because it is Saul looking for what he lost that reveals God's plan for his life. It was in the process of him looking for these lost donkeys that seemed to have not much value or not much purpose, but it meant something to Saul. And because it meant something to Saul, God was able to use it to set the stage for the next dimension of who he was going to be. When we begin our text, Saul is about to give up on looking for the donkeys. And his servant says to him, he says, listen, before we give up, there is a prophet, there is a seer who may be able to tell us which direction to look in. I love this because what it spoke to me is the value of having someone in your life who can add valuable perspective to your search. Yeah. I know so many times I'm like coaching people who want to be in relationships and, and I want to find someone who I can go to the movies with and, and I want to cuddle with someone. But when I decided to marry my husband, I was searching for what I lost. And so when he decided to come into my life, the only thing I wanted to know is can you add valuable perspective to my search? That's really, that's really good because I need someone who is going to help me get back to the version of me that God knew, the version of me that life tried to take away from me in the process. All perspective is not good perspective, but there is something about having someone who adds valuable perspective to your life. You may not be able to fix the problem for me, but if you could widen my lens so that I can see all of the possible resources, then you've added valuable perspective for me. You should start asking your friendships and asking of your relationships what type of perspective do you add to me? Because sometimes people add perspective that is uh, not always necessary. And if you're one of those people, we love you. We just want you to know that when we're gaining weight and you tell us we're gaining weight, that doesn't help us. That's not valuable perspective. <laughs> but there is something about having someone in your circle who adds a valuable perspective to your growth. And when you have that, you need to honor those people in your life because it is that valuable perspective that the servant gave that led him one step closer to his destiny. I didn't just come to church because I wanted to feel good and sing songs. I came to church because I needed some perspective added to my situation. I needed some valuable perspective. I didn't just stop talking to certain people because I didn't love them. I just needed some valuable perspective. And whenever I presented my purpose and presented my dream, you made me think it was impossible. And so I learned that I had to protect what God was doing in my life and only allow people who could see it properly access to me. I need valuable perspective. 
I don't need just any kind of insight. I need someone who has prayed and submitted their vision to God so when they look at my situation, they see the possibilities for miracles. Don't, no, don't come bringing me no more bad news. I don't need any more statistics. I don't need any more issues. I don't need any more problems. If you can't help me save this child, if you can't help me write this book, then pray for me and go sit down in the corner somewhere. Because I need valuable perspective. I need anointed perspective. Not everybody can speak into my marriage. Not everyone can speak into my dream. Not everyone understands what God is doing for me. I need valuable perspective. That's why I woke up this morning and dragged myself into church. I could have been anywhere else, but I decided I needed a word from the Lord because it adds value to my perspective. Maybe I really am fearfully and wonderfully made. Maybe his grace is sufficient. Maybe I can do anything with Christ within me. I needed some valuable perspective. Someone who understood that what I was searching for has value to me. The donkeys that Saul is looking for, they add value to who he is. And so I need people in my life and I need opportunities in my life and I need ministry in my life that recognizes the value in what I lost. Don't shame me, don't condemn me, don't make me feel any worse than I already feel. I need you to help add value and perspective to my search. And so Saul's servant, adds value, and this is what I love. This is when we start really getting into the beauty of the text. It's because Saul is looking for his donkeys, that's it. But at the same time that they have decided to go and see Saul, Samuel, at the same time they've decided to go see Samuel, God has told Samuel, I'm sending someone to you who I'm going to anoint as king. Saul is looking for his donkeys. Samuel is looking for a king. God says, I'm sending someone to you who's going to be king, but they think they're just looking for donkeys. So when Saul sees Samuel, all he's thinking about is his donkeys. But when Samuel sees Saul, he's thinking about the kingdom. Oh, God. Yeah, this is the moment when we realize that the search was just an excuse to get Saul in position. Oh, Lord, help me. To Saul, it seemed like Samuel was on the move and that he was just going about his everyday function. They said, when you see Samuel, he's going to be moving up to the high place. So when Saul sees Samuel... It looks like he's just going about his everyday life. It looks like he's just doing what he's supposed to be doing. He doesn't know that Samuel is waiting on him. <laughs> That's really good to me. Because right now it looks like the industry is just moving. Right now it looks like the world is just turning. Right now it looks like everything is just functioning and you're the only one who has a need. But I hear God saying, it looks like it's moving, but in reality, it's actually waiting on you to arrive. I'm going to let the people who really need that take about 10 seconds to thank God that it looks like it's moving, but it's really waiting on the anointing I carry. It looks like it's gonna move on without me. It looks like maybe it could just slip past me, but I know that God has prepared something for me. This is a word for somebody who recognizes that God has already spoken a word over my life. He's already made it known who I'm gonna be. So I'm gonna stay in position because while it looks like everything is moving, it's actually waiting on me. It looks like everybody's doing okay. It looks like the industry doesn't need another voice like mine, but the reality is it's waiting on me, baby. It's waiting on me, baby. It's waiting on me to step in position. It's waiting on me to answer my call. It's waiting on me to recognize who I am. It's waiting on me. 
I'm not scared. I'm not gonna lose my spot. I'm not gonna lose my position. It's waiting on me. It may look like it's moving, it's award season. It may look like it's moving, it's promotion season. But I'm not worried about that because what's mine is mine. What God has set apart for me, no man can touch. It's still waiting on me. That child is still waiting on me. That job is still waiting on me. <laughs> That's why you got to go back and figure out what you lost because it was in the process of Saul figuring out what he lost that it led him to who he was always supposed to be. And don't be afraid or discouraged when it looks like everything is moving on and that you're just left behind trying to find what you, find what you lost. I was supposed to graduate by now. I should have started my business by now. I'm just trying to figure out what I lost in the process. But because you have committed to figuring out what you lost, God says I can bless that. Because if I give you more, you won't lose it. You'll stop everything until you find it because you have decided to not just live without what you lost. And it was in this hunt, and it was in this search that he told the prophet Samuel, wait for him, wait for him. He told the prophet Samuel the day before that he's coming. He didn't tell Saul the day before, he told Samuel, because he did not want to dilute Saul's vision and make him start looking for a crown when at that time he was only supposed to be looking for what he lost. But he told the next dimension that he's on his way. God, I wanna let that go. He prepared the next dimension for what was happening in this dimension because he knew it was only a matter of time before the two dimensions collided. And when the two dimensions collide, I want you to be prepared because if you look at what you see in this dimension, you'll see a boy looking for a donkey. But I want you to know that what God sees is a man who can become king. So God has already gone ahead of you and let them know they may not have the degree and they may not speak the language that everyone else speaks, but I'm letting you know in advance there's someone coming who carries what you need. And so, in my text, Samuel and Saul are about to engage in their first discussion. I love this because Saul doesn't even know who he's speaking to. He says, do you know where the seer is? Prophet Samuel says, fool. I am the seer, it's okay. If you're gonna be king, I'm gonna to have to get you more anointed. If you're gonna be king, you're gonna to have to start looking for certain things differently. If you're gonna be king, if you're gonna start eating like a king and acting like a king, you're gonna to have to recognize that any person you talk to could carry you to the next dimension of your destiny. Oh yeah, yeah. You can always tell who a person really is by how they speak to the people they don't think they need. And so immediately, Saul's inability to recognize who Samuel is let Samuel know, I'm going to have to start preparing you for kingship. I love that because God's not just going to put you in a situation that you're not prepared for. He's going to create a bridge, a person, an opportunity, a mentor who is going to prepare you for who you're supposed to be. You're not just connected to this ministry. You're not just connected to those people who you have been admiring on Instagram. You're not just connected to those people who have been pouring into your life. They're your bridge to help train you for the kingship that God has assigned to your name. Before this uh, encounter, 
Saul and his servant have a discussion and say to one another, okay, if we're going to go see the seer, then we need to make sure we have some kind of gift so that we can honor who the seer is. And so they scratch up, they scrape together what they have so that they have something to honor the seer with. But what shakes them is when the seer, the prophet Samuel begins to honor them. Yeah, he says, Samuel says to him, I am the seer, go up before me to the high place for you shall eat with me today and tomorrow I will let you go and will tell you all that is in your heart. And then he tells them where the donkeys are, but then Saul immediately rejects what Samuel says in that moment. Which taught me that sometimes we are more prepared to give honor than we are to receive honor. Because as long as Saul was the one giving, he was okay. But when Samuel said something to him that would have to stretch his capacity and make him capable of receiving, he rejected it. And I wonder how often we're willing to pour into other people and we're willing to love other people. But when it's time for us to level up within ourselves, we reject the very thing that was meant to help us get to that next dimension of who God has called us to be. It really is easier to give than receive because receiving challenges my insecurities. Receiving challenges the areas where I have deficiencies. Receiving makes me look at the areas where I have brokenness and it makes me easier to just give to you and give to you and give to you instead of receiving in return. But Samuel and Saul are gonna be in relationship for a long time. And Saul recognizes that if you're going to be king and you're not prepared to be king, man, I felt like that was for somebody. You're not prepared to be king yet. I'm not shaming you. I'm just letting you know where you are so that you can receive what you need in order to become king. Because if you stay in a position where you realize I'm, I'm not ready yet and I'm okay with not being ready yet, I just need someone who's gonna come into my life that's gonna help me get ready so that when I get there, I don't squander it. So that when I get there, I don't lose myself in the process. I'm okay not being ready yet. Everyone else can get promoted because if they're ready, God will keep them there. And if they're not ready, God will remove them. But when I get there, I wanna stay. And so I need someone who recognizes that I'm not prepared yet. And so the first thing that he does is he challenges him to receive honor, to receive the high seat at the table. Samuel says, to walk up ahead of me. <laughs> Man, go up before me means that you're gonna walk ahead of me. At that time, Samuel's the highest priest there is, but he says to Saul, I want you to walk ahead of me. I want you to start walking like a king. <sighs> Man, God help me. I want you to start walking differently. I want you to stop walking like you're looking for what you lost because God has already given you what you've lost. You know, I think that sometimes we can be so consumed with just getting what we lost that we're not prepared for the overflow connected to it. <laughs> because God doesn't just give you what you lost. He gives you exceedingly and abundantly above all that you could ask or imagine. But the question is, will you be prepared for the training that comes with the exceedingly and abundantly? Because sometimes we just want what we lost so that we can go back to who we were. But God says, I'm gonna give you what you lost, but you can't go back to who you were. There's overflow connected to what you lost. And so I wanna know, can you learn to eat like a king? What I wanna know is, can you learn to boss up to the overflow? I wanna know, will you open the books in the middle of the night and start reading and studying to prepare for the next meeting? I wanna know, can you eat like a king? You just wanted a job, I gave you a promotion. But now I wanna know, can you level up and eat like a king? I feel that gangster thing coming out of me. I'm trying to stay cute and say, sanctified up here, but there's something about someone who knows that I have to learn how to eat like a king, because every time God does something for me, he takes me to glory, to glory, to glory, to glory, and I won't be the reason that I get left behind. If God's going to take me into the overflow, 
I'm gonna make sure that I know how to handle the overflow when he gives it to me. I'm gonna learn how to eat like a king. I'm gonna learn how to walk like a king. I'm gonna learn how to talk like a king. If God says I'm a king, then I must be. I must be the righteousness of God. I must be a part of a royal priesthood. If God keeps blessing me in spite of the mess that I am, then I'm gonna give him something to work with. I'm gonna give him every tool. I'm gonna give him every resource. It's time to start eating like a king. It's time to start walking like a king. It's time to start changing your mindset and recognize that God doesn't just want to give you what you lost. I want to show you who I saw when you were looking for what you lost. And it may make you uncomfortable. And it may mean that it changes your circle. But I'm telling you for what you're going to be exposed to that I placed down on the inside of you, it's going to be worth it. It would be a disservice if God just gave you what you lost and sent Saul back to Benjamin, God says, I can do better than that. I can show you what you lost and I can show you who you are. I can show you why you had to lose what you lost. I can show you how all things work together for your good. I could just stop at what you lost, but I'm too much of a God for that. I'm too big for that. I'm too great for that. I'm too wonderful. I'm too strategic. I'm too strategic to just give you what you lost. I got to show you how it all worked together. This is it. This is just when I want to say, Saul begins to walk ahead. And then when they get to the feast, the prophet Samuel says to him, I want you to sit in the place of honor among those who are invited. I want you to sit in a room where nobody knows what's going on but me and you. He says there's about 30 people in the room. These 30 people have no idea that Saul's about to be king. And I want you to be okay with not everyone knowing who you are, but you. Oh God. <laughs> I need you to be okay with not everyone understanding the grace and the anointing that is on your life. It might just be you and God for a season. Don't worry, soon enough, everybody will see what God saw. But can you be okay if nobody knows it but you and God? Nobody knows how talented I am. That's all right, let them sleep. Nobody knows how gifted I am. That's all right, let them sleep. Because you're not ready for it to be exposed anyway. But God will sit you in the room to give you a preview of what the room feels like before the room knows that it's you. Because I want you to see the character of all the people who are going to be around you before they know that you're king. Because when they find out you're king, they may want something from you. Yeah. I want you to see everyone properly. So I'm gonna sit you in the room, but the room's not gonna know who you are. I don't know if you've ever had an encounter with someone who didn't really know who you were until they knew who you were. And you say to yourself, you say, self, before you knew who I was, you didn't treat me that well. But now that you know who I am, I see you. But that's all right, I forgive you. Because when you didn't know who I was, I knew who I was. I never needed you to know who I was. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, sorry, I got a little. So everyone's sitting down at the table and Saul is sitting there with his servant and Samuel says to the cook, he says, bring the portion which I gave you, of which I said to you, set it apart. 
So the cook took up the thigh with its upper part and set it before Saul and Samuel said, here it is what was kept back. Samuel says to Saul, here it is what has been kept back. It was set apart for you. As if you needed any more confirmation that I was expecting you. I just wanted you to know that I didn't just think about you walking like a king. And I didn't just think about you sitting like a king. That I also took into consideration that you need to know what it's like to eat like a king. And when you learn how to eat like a king, it means means that you expect that there is something that has been set apart with my name on it. There is something in this world. There is something in this marriage. There is something in this business. There is something in this industry that has been set apart in anticipation of my arrival. So I'm not just walking like a king. I'm not just sitting like a king. I'm about to eat like a king. I'm looking for the thing that has been set apart. I prayed, I said, God, give me this generation of women. And God gave me that generation of women. God said, I've been setting apart a generation of women for you because I knew that the day would come when you would learn how to walk, talk, and eat like a king. And so my question for you, the Potter's House of Los Angeles and the Potter's House of Denver is are you ready to go and find that thing that God has set aside for you? God says I've been keeping it back. God says I've set it apart and I'm just waiting on somebody who expects that it's been set apart. It's been set apart for you. Your joy has been set apart. Your purpose has been set apart. Your destiny has been set apart. Your marriage has been set apart. Your ministry has been set apart. It's been set apart for you. Nobody stole it. Your past didn't kill it. Shame couldn't touch it. You went back into the enemy's camp and you're going to take back everything he stole from you because it's time for me to start eating like a king. It's time for me to start understanding why I was the one who had to go through hell. And so when I walk into a room, the room either has something set apart for me or it's not the room I'm supposed to be in. Because if God brings me to the room, there's something set apart for me. There's a job here that only I can do. When I met my husband, he had been set apart. Not everyone could have access to him and that's how I knew he was the one because he'd already been set apart. He was in Los Angeles, far from where I was, but he had been set apart for me. The Potter's House Los Angeles had been set apart for me. The Potter's House Denver had been set apart for me. My father started the church over eight years ago and it didn't even look like we would have any reason to be here. But God said, just give it some time, I set it apart for them. Just give it some time, I set it apart. When you touch down in Los Angeles, I've got some women who you need to touch. It's been set apart. But the reality is that Saul would have never found what had been set apart had he not made it his mission to figure out what he lost. And if you're in this room and you know without a shadow of a doubt, I've lost some things and I've learned to live with what I lost. And I was kind of proud that I learned to live with what I lost. But as you were speaking, there was something in me that made me want to go back and get that innocence, that made me want to go back and get that confidence, that made me want to go back and get that joy. There was something in me that made me believe that I wanted to go back and get that forgiveness. I lost, I lost some things along the way. And you cannot learn to eat like a king, or walk like a king, or talk like a king until you first discover what you lost and decide that I'm going to go back and get it.